Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week programming. I'm Dr. Jessica Hanshaw, Education and Curations Manager with the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. We'll begin today's presentation with a few words from Texas State Senator Jose Menendez before we introduce our speakers. Hi, I'm State Senator Jose Menendez, and I'd like to welcome you to Holocaust Remembrance Week of 2022. I am so pleased to joining students from across Texas and learning about the Holocaust. I also want to say thank you to the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission, to the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio, and to all of the partners who've made these educational resources available to schools across the whole state of Texas. In 2019, State Representative Richard Raymond and I collaborated to pass Senate Bill 1828. The bill calls on the governor of the state to designate a Holocaust Remembrance Week in order to educate students about the Holocaust and inspire a sense of responsibility to recognize and uphold human value that helps prevent future atrocities. The bill passed both the House and Senate unanimously. That tells you how important this effort is to all of us. Senate Bill 1828 was made possible because of the persistence of local upstanders who call themselves the four ladies in a car because of their frequent trips to Austin on a mission to have a state designated Holocaust Remembrance Week in Texas. They understand that it is a solemn duty to remember the Holocaust and to foster communities of awareness, care, and kindness. You're going to learn the stories of survivors of the Holocaust and about the upstanders whose compassionate actions saved many lives. You too can be heroes by speaking up whenever you witness injustice around you or create change by working with your neighbors and local leaders to improve your community. I invite you to continue learning year round about the heroic acts of upstanding. And just like the four ladies in a car, please reach out to your elected officials in order to make a difference. You're always welcome to reach out to me at 210-733-6604. And I wanna thank you for joining me today. And I hope you share everything you learned throughout this observation of the Holocaust Remembrance Week with everyone you meet. Have a great day. At this time, I am pleased to introduce our speakers today. We are joined by Dr. Jason Morrow and Dr. Rachel, Van Rachel Vandermeer, who will be presenting today. Dr. Morrow is an Associate Professor of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, where he's also the Howard and Betty Health Professor of Medical Humanities and Ethics. Dr. Morrow is board certified in internal medicine and hospice and palliative medicine, and is a fellow of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. He graduated with a BS in biology and a BA in philosophy from Trinity University in San Antonio and took his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, where he also received his PhD in medical humanities with a focus on clinical ethics. Dr. Morrow completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He then joined the faculty at Duke University, where he was an academic hospitalist and medical director of the palliative care at Duke Regional Hospital. He is the 2012 recipient of the Kunis Dixon Physician Award and the 2013 recipient of the Alpha Omega Alpha Edward D. Harris Professional Award. Dr. Morrow was, was founding medical director for palliative care and patient consultation at University Health Systems from 2011 to 2020. He helps to lead the ethics curriculum for the Long School of Medicine and teaches ethics and palliative medicine to medical students, residents, and faculty on campuses around the country. He also enjoys spending time with his wife and kids and dogs and hiking around San Antonio and the Texas Hill Country. Dr. Rachel, Wa Rachel Walker Vandermeer is currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at UT Health San Antonio. She is the inpatient pediatric palliative care medical director at the University Hospital in San Antonio. As part of her role, she helped develop the University Health System perinatal palliative care program, which provides perinatal palliative care to families expecting a baby with serious illness. Regarding education, she currently participates in both adult and pediatric hospice and palliative medicine fellowship education, and she is involved in medical student pediatric clerkship education as the assistant pediatric clerkship director. Lastly, she serves on the admissions committee for the Joe R. and Teresa Lozano Long School of Medicine. 
She completed a degree in biochemistry at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, and then proceeded to medical school at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. She finished pediatric residency at Dell Children's Hospital of Central Texas for the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School. After residency, she entered a combined adult and pediatric hospice, hospice and palliative medicine fellowship at UT Health San Antonio. Again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Morrow and Dr. Vandermeer, and I will turn it over to you. Hi, all. Welcome. I am just going to share my screen. Let's see here. Okay, make sure that this little dance is ready. I don't think that is the one I want. Well done, people. Here we go. Alrighty. Uh, well, welcome. Um, as uh, Jessica said, I am uh, Dr. Rachel Van Muir. I am one of the palliative providers at University um, uh, Health, and uh, Dr. Morrow is my colleague at talking today. Um, I, we had this beautiful introduction, so we were going to do intros ourselves, but I don't think that we need to. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so today we're going to be really spending some time talking about um, the physician's role uh, during the Holocaust, and um, um, unfortunately, the horrible events that really occurred at the hands of physicians. But instead of just talking about what they did, we also really want to talk about how this all came about because we think it's really important not just what happened, but why it happened and how it happened so that we can better understand um, how to prevent something like this in the future. Um, and Dr. Morrow is going to spend some time talking about um, the events uh, that occurred after the Holocaust, what the impact that the Holocaust had on the medical community. Um, and really the ethics uh, that evolved out of um, these horrible events. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump right in. Um, so I was first introduced uh, to the Holocaust by this book, uh, Number of the Stars, and this actually may have been, many for many of you, the very first introduction um, to the Holocaust. I was fifth in fifth grade, um, and after I finished reading this book about a little girl and her family who helped uh, shelter a young little girl who was Jewish um, and helped this little girl get across um, the a, a ocean uh, to um, Norway, um, I was really just completely fascinated by what in the world did I just read? Like, what do you mean that uh, there were these Germans who were trying to kill Jews? Like, I just completely was just totally did not understand um, what was happening and um, what happened and why it happened. But I think my biggest question was really, how did this happen? Like, how in the world does an entire country decide to just kill a certain group of people? Like, how does that even come about? Um, and I can genuinely say that that has been a question that I have been chasing my whole life. Um, I kept asking that question um, and continued to study. Um, and I began to realize that that how is so important. Um, I think oftentimes when we think about the Holocaust, we really focus on the what. And I think that what can, it's very important that we know what happened. But I also think it can be super overwhelming. Um, and it's traumatizing and it's horrible. These things that we're learning about, we're just like, oh my gosh, what, what, do, you, what do you do with that? Um, and then I think the next question we ask is why? You know, when we learn about um, Hitler and we learn about his philosophy and the philosophy of the Nazis and um, we start, you know, trying to understand, well, you know, this just seems really fringe and this just seems really like extreme. Like, why would anybody in the world even believe this? And sometimes we kind of walk away with this idea that the Nazis were these horrible, awful monsters, right? They were like these aliens um, who came and they just did all of these awful things. Um, and this could never really happen again because they were just so, so horrible. And obviously, if I saw that monster, I would never, ever participate in something like this. And I don't think that, you know, pop culture really helps helps us with this, you know, Marvel uh, really likes to draw upon the stories of uh, World War II, you know, because the Nazis are really, really good, horrible, awful bad guys, right? Like, they're the best bad guy out there. Um, and so, you know, here you have Red Skull and Captain America, and we kind of walk away with this idea that, well, this is not something that could ever happen in the United States. Um, but if we really take a step back, you know, and kind of start examining what happened, um, and we come at the Holocaust with the question of how, 
you know, we start to learn some really um, interesting things that really do start to teach us how not only what happened, but how we could prevent this in the future. So I want you to really stare at this picture. Do you see anything that just seems really out of place? That you're looking at this and you see, you know, these guards who are guiding, who are guiding these really just scared and dejected prisoners towards, you know, their deaths. Um, is there anything that really just strikes you as, wow, like, why would that be there? What about this ambulance, right? Like, why is there an ambulance in this picture, right? Like, when we think about ambulances, we think about people coming and rushing in for help. So why would an ambulance be taking people to a gas chamber in their death? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, if you really start examining the leadership of um, the Nazis and who was really high in their administration, you actually start to find that there were a lot of doctors. Um, so only 10% of the uh, general German population was actually enrolled in the Nazi party. Did you know that um, that 40% of the German physicians at the time were enrolled in the Nazi party. So 10% of civilians, but 40% of the physicians were enrolled in the Nazi party. And upwards of 45% of um, the people in the Nazi party were physicians at one time. Like that's just really like mind boggling. And when I first discovered this, I was a medical student actually taking a class on eugenics. And it really just made me take a step back and go, oh my gosh, like what is happening? here and I started to began to put some of these pieces together as to how this happened this picture that's on the right um, you can see uh, prisoners who are being unloaded off of these train cars you know and they're tired and they're exhausted and now they're being selected right um, on the ramp do you know who's performing the selection that German officer is a physician. It was actually a physician who decided whether the prisoner was going to go um, left or right and whether they were gonna go to death or whether they were going to enter into the camp. So let's back up. How did we end up here? So really, it kind of starts in a really bizarre place, something that you would consider really benign, something that was really wonderful for our scientific community. Um, so in 1859, uh, Darwin published his Origin of the Species, um, and we began to really be think about how species evolve over time, um, how species um, adapt um, and change uh, with their environment, right? Um, well, he had a cousin um, named Sir Francis Galton who happened to be a statistician, which basically means he just loved math. Um, and he really um, began to apply not just math, but also um, Darwinism to uh, the human species. And he be really began to wonder, well, is there a way for us to arrange reproduction? Can we get involved in human breeding so that we can improve the human race? Um, and he took all of these kind of good scientific thoughts, right, that came out of evolution, and he really distorted them, and he um, confused them, and it wasn't just him, I'm kind of picking on him because he was really a leader in this, but there were many, many people who were involved in this, but what came out of this was this scientific, right, um, really pseudoscience, but this scientific definition of who in the human race was superior, who was worthy, who was considered valuable and productive, and then who um, were the degenerate, who were the unvaluable, who were the societal blights that we really need to get rid of. And over time, this became a conversation about um, the rights of citizens, and that there were these good citizens, but then there were also these lesser citizens. And so this really led to the eugenics movement in the United States. Um, and I really want to point out that, you know, so, so uh, Sir Francis Galton was in England, um, and then eugenics really kind of blossomed in the United States. So we haven't even started talking about Germany, right? So really, we're talking about our own backyard. Um, so in the 19, early 1900s, um, the France, um, some individuals in France developed the IQ test, which, by the way, was designed to be an academic test. It was just supposed to tell you um, kind of where you were compared to peers, but it really became corrupted by some leaders in the United States so that it became a static label of unintelligent, so that if you didn't do well on this test, you were never going to do well and you were considered less than worthy. Um, and they actually began to use this test um, to target certain populations in society. Um, and then we uh, developed 
to these sterilization clinics. So now not only are we labeling people as um, less than worthy or degenerate, now uh, they're actually putting into practice Galton's theory that we can uh, control human breeding. And so they were going to sterilize those individuals who were considered undesirable. And who were those undesirable? In anybody with mental illness, right? Um, individuals who had severe epilepsy, individuals um, who were intellectually deficient. And you can see how widespread this was. This was not some fringe idea. This was not just a few people in the United States. This was a very large number of people. This was readily accepted by the scientific community. So eugenics was really um, propped up as a public health movement. You had doctors in white coats saying that it was the right thing to do to get rid, to get rid of some lesser people. So this is how we end up at Auschwitz, right? So, um, you know, Nazi Germany kind of comes uh, to rise and they look over at England and they look over at America and they say, huh, like we're going to actually copy some of the things that you are doing um, in the United States here in Germany. And so they started with their own sterilization laws and they actually looked to our laws to write their own. Um, and at first they were really just targeting um, hereditary conditions. And then over time, they took it one step further, right? They actually started to euthanize, which means that they do medicalized killing or medicalized murder. Um, and they were murdering children uh, with physical and mental illness. And then they began uh, to move towards adults. Um, in late uh, 39, they actually developed the T4 program, which is what the gas chamber, which is where the gas chambers came from. But I think it's really important to recognize that gas chambers were actually first used for um, mentally ill, for the elderly, and for individuals with physical disabilities. And then they were actually moved to uh, the concentration camp. So they really, it really started off as being used in the medical community and it had all of this medical backing, which is how um, this what, how the Holocaust became billed as a public health movement. And for me, this was really eye-opening because I began to see how the German people could kind of go along with this. They had, it wasn't just people getting up and yelling. If you've ever heard, you know, Hitler do, uh, you know, speaking, you know, he's this very like loud person and you're just kind of like, why would anybody follow him? He kind of sounds angry and crazy, right? Um, but it was because he had all of these white coats standing behind him saying, hey, this is the right thing to do. And so when the final solution came about um, in the summer of 1941, um, this was this widespread movement to um, basically annihilate the Jewish race um, in Europe. And when Dr. Edward Wurst, he was the chief physician at Auschwitz and he um, took charge in 1942, he decided that it was only physicians who could determine whether or not a prisoner was going to go to the gas chamber. So this wasn't just genocide. This was actually medicalized murder, right? This all had this air of authority, which is why so many people went along with this. So the million plus that were murdered at Auschwitz were actually killed by physicians. They were, they, physicians were the ones selecting at the ramp, they were the ones selecting at the blocks, and they were the ones supervising killing in the gas chambers. So when we stand at this gate, right, this is the entrance to um, Auschwitz. When we stand at this gate, I think it requires that we come here with a great deal of humility, recognizing the power as physicians that we have to sway people, both for the good, which is what we always think of, but also how, if we're not careful, things could very quickly go awry, right? Um, and because we have so much authority, um, it really causes us to take a step back and be very humble and recognize it is so important, the values that we portray in our community and that we protect the values of equity. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Moore to talk a little bit about what happens in the scientific community after the Holocaust. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vandermeer. And hey, everybody, uh, nice, to, nice to be present in this space with you. I don't see any of you. <laughs> All I see is Dr. Vandermeer in the slide and myself, um, but I trust you're out there and I'm imagining what your uh, experience is. Uh, it's been a long week. Um, this is serious and important um, history and dynamics to really understand. So I just wanna acknowledge you 
um, and your willingness to be present and participate in, in deepening your own understanding of history and complex dynamics that could still be at work today. And I want to thank you because um, it takes a lot to stay in this space emotionally, sometimes physically. It's hard to just sit and be a part of this. And also thank you for the lessons that you might take from this and the change that you might make um, in, your, in your lives. So Dr. Vandermeer touched on what I think is a core feature of the Holocaust and how it connects to the legacy within the, med within the medical establishment. She mentioned power dynamics and the seeing of others as, as less than. Well, the doctor-patient relationship historically has been one where the doctor has authority. Doctor knows best. Doctor has keys to the technology kingdom. Parents, loved ones take their wounded, they're injured, they're sick to the doctor in hopes of rescue. It's like a priestly role and there's power because there's a power differential. One is seeking help and one is offering. One will walk out of the relationship, hopefully healed and improved, but one was never wounded to begin with and gets paid for it. There is an axis of authority and power at work in the doctor-patient relationship. And we can't overstate how rattling, how jarring the participation of physicians in Nazi Germany has been and will always be to the medical profession. We have to stay awake to the lessons from Nazi Germany. So, you know, you may have experienced some shock to learn that the forced sterilization in Nazi Germany was a borrowed lesson from across the sea. Well, it may also shock you to learn that in the United States, we were perpetrating crimes, um, maybe not on as grand a scale, but uh, with equal offense and moral injury um, as was conducted anywhere in the world. And it emerged with some of the dynamics Dr. Vandermeer talks about. Like, it's not all at once. It's not snap your finger. It's not like such an obvious who's the bad guy here. It emerges in a context where there are seeds of possibility of abuse of power. In the early 1930s, the United States was wrestling with how to treat syphilis, which could be a lethal, a fatal condition, right? It's an infectious disease. And honestly, they didn't understand how it was transmitted, much less how to fix it. And they had some available toxins like mercury, arsenic, other things that could treat it, but not very effectively, highly toxic um, treatments. So in the early 30s, uh, there came an opportunity in the South at the Tuskegee Institute to, uh, to try um, un to understand the natural course of syphilis if it's left untreated at all. So they found this captive population, 600 poor sharecroppers, African-American men in Macon County, Al Alabama, who were recruited to participate in a study on bad blood, or at that time, um, uh, they might have termed that, uh, thought of that as anemia. And they were offered special free treatment, but it wasn't special free treatment. It was actually spinal taps to test their spinal fluid, uh, but it was under the auspices of the medical establishment. The nurse for the community helped to recruit participants and she was present for these special free treatments. These individuals would have had no way to know that they were sick, and that they were just being studied with no plan to intervene. And it's important to recognize that penicillin was discovered years after the study started and was withheld from study participants. When they tried to seek penicillin, they were told not to. And the study continued all throughout World War II and was not terminated until 1972 after a whistleblower. So the stain of human rights violations in the care of vulnerable individuals um, is a legacy in American medical research. And uh, so in terms of the timeline, the Nazi doctors you can see from 39 to 45 conducted these horrible experiments, which were barely scientific, more like torture um, on captive individuals. They were held to accountability at the trial of Nuremberg 
called the Nazi doctors trial in, the, in late 1946. There were 23 doctors who were on trial and all but seven were uh, convicted. Uh, several were um, hung to death and the rest were imprisoned for a very long time. And at this trial, the tenets of informed consent of what it means to respect people came to light. We started to put words to put texture on these ideals and the Nuremberg Code represents a key moment. It was the moment where we said, you know what? We need to say this stuff out loud. We cannot rely on just the good intentions of doctors, of other leaders, because they get co-opted into other purposes. Power can corrupt. So we need to articulate guiding principles. And that's what came out through the Nuremberg Code. This sets the scene for the rest of the 20th century in terms of how we oversee the participation of human subjects research. Included in this document was the opening line famously, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. And over the ensuing decades, other, other, um, other, <laughs> other events happened in our country, uh, including Willowbrook, including thalidomide. And it was in the late seventies where the public attention and public scrutiny to human subjects research sort of reached a boiling point. And Congress passed the, the National Research Act in 1974, creating a commission to study uh, to study oversight of human subjects research. It also created a requirement that any federally funded research would have institutional review boards, right? This would be a check on power. This would mean no one person can put in uh, to place research that could violate human rights. You may wonder, and wait a minute, this is a story of human experimentation. What does it have to do with medical practice? Well, the reality is that much of human experimentation is led by physicians. So this white coat that Dr. Vandermeer mentioned is used in this domain of science and healthcare. And doctors stand in some way as a representation of both of those establishments. In the late 1970s, um, a bunch of philosophers, theorists, and physicians and experts got behind closed doors and said, we, we need to outline what are the core ethical values at stake in human subjects research and honestly in medical practice. And they articulated three, respect for persons grounded on the principle of respect for autonomy and dignity. Every individual has a right to dignity, which means that their will and their voluntariness should be respected, which means that their rationality, their ability to reason and make judgments for themselves needs to be respected and honored. Beneficence reflects the need to try to do right, to do well for the person in front of you, to promote their well-being and health. And justice, which means treating people fairly. And it also includes making sure that vulnerable or at-risk populations have access to resources, including access to cutting-edge research. And these guidelines from the Belmont Report became the foundation for the Code of Federal Regulations, which to this day, and you can see revisions from 81, 91, and 2018, that define exactly how the federal government can oversee human subjects research and manage the IRB or Institutional Review Board membership and processes. And overall, these regulations ensure that informed consent is something that remains front and center to any research for it to get approved and for it to continue. And Dr. Vandermeer uh, can tell you both she and I in our daily work, we actually try to honor these principles of respect for persons, beneficence and justice. But one of the legacies of the 20th century is it became an opportunity for us to take a close hard look at what we're doing and why and how we are justified in exercising this power that is provisionally entrusted to us. How do we do that? Well, we have to be mindful of the values that, um, that underlie the sacred trust the patients in our community gives to us. So if you can advance the slide there, uh, Dr. Vandermeer. So <laughs> we gave you a lot of information and you might say, what am I supposed to do with all of this information? The legacy of the 20th century, the legacy of, legacy of the Holocaust and medical practice and in human subjects research. And Dr. Vandermeer and I are gonna just share with you if that's okay, just uh, a little bit about why we're interested in this and where we seek hope when we get um, deep into these stories. 
So these are some of my very favorite uh, friends, and I do call them friends, even though I've never met them in person. Um, so when I was in medical school, I had the distinct honor of getting to do a thesis project looking at prisoner physicians, not Nazi physicians, but um, Jewish uh, persons and persons who were invested in helping uh, the Jewish population um, who had ended up imprisoned at Auschwitz. Um, and these are some of the doctors. So uh, you can see my cursor. This is Dr. Gisela Pearl, and this is Dr. Ella Lingens Reiner, and this is Dr. Victor Frankel. Um, and she, this was a medical student at the time, uh, Dr. Olga Lingel, um, who all were imprisoned at Auschwitz. Um, and their work, their time there was very different than what these Nazis were doing. Both had, you know, an MD, but all of them had taken the Hippocratic Oath. But these physicians really, um, you know, took that oath and uh were determined to uphold it despite the fact that they were standing um, in the middle of Auschwitz uh, with a huge uh you know smoke um, rising to the air in the air um, and breathing in the ash of their own people um, and knowing that they could themselves be killed for helping others inside the camp they insisted on upholding their oath. Um, and their stories um, are just so beautiful. And really, they taught me more than anything I ever learned in medical school or residency or fellowship. Um, by far and away, these are the physicians who have been my guiding light in my own practice. And I think what Dr. Morrow and I really wanted um, to spend some time talking about is what does all of this mean for us in our daily world, right? Because I think it's one thing to take the time to learn what happened in the Holocaust, but it's an entirely different thing to figure out how to make it functional in your daily life, right? Like, how do you hear about the death of millions of people, the horrible, awful, like systematic murder and say, oh yeah, like that applies to like my everyday world. Like we are so grateful that it doesn't, right? So how do we take all of this information and really think about our daily interactions and the legacy that some of these um, upstanders really have um, and what they taught us. And I'm going to let Dr. Morrow talk a little bit about what we do. Yeah, so we're, we're doctors, you know, we, we, uh, we went to college and then we went to medical school. And, uh, and then after medical school, you go through training. It's like an apprenticeship. They call it residency. Uh, Dr. Vandermeer uh, did her residency in pediatrics and I did mine in internal medicine, which is like, you know, general adult care. So uh, for, you know, for example, we can handle infections, we can handle uh, injuries to the brain, um, ideal, you know, heart attacks and strokes in the adults. Um, so we do general medicine, but we specialize in palliative care. Now, palliative care, what it is, I would, if you were here that I could see you, I would say, hey, who knows what it is, or who wants to guess. Uh, but palliative care is an area of medical care and nursing care, honestly, chaplaincy as well, that focuses on the care of individuals with serious illness who may be at risk for dying and need an extra layer of support. So we do a lot of symptom management like pain, anxiety, trouble sleeping, problems with nausea, vomiting for folks who may be really sick, have cancer, have other serious illness and or injuries. We help with decision making, people who are trying to think about life and death decisions, and we help with resources and support to make sure that people get their spiritual and emotional and social needs addressed. Because when you're sick, it's not just it's not just your body, it's your whole person. And with that we, we lean into that, we care about it. And you may ask, a lot of people ask us, why? Why would you spend your medical career focusing on people who were at risk for dying, right? Isn't that depressing? Don't you want to just patch people up and get them on their way? And let me just say, we want people to get better. We love it when our kids, our, our patients and their families are healed and restored. But we also recognize that people who can't get better, who can't get restored, are just as worthy and just as precious as anybody else. In fact, in our culture, the weak, the weary, the wounded are often marginalized and seen as lesser than. And like Dr. Vandermeer, I, I'm going to guess I had 
people in my medical career who who were able to go into these sacred spaces and be advocates for people at the end of life. And, and I thought, wow, she's awesome. I want to do that. It may not get all the money. It may not get all the glory, but I get to be an advocate for human rights, for people who are just trying to live well, even though they may be dying. And, and every day I get little rewards from this that are restorative to my soul, even though death, dying and cancer is scary and it can be overwhelming. Um, I find ways, little ways each day to honestly just be useful <laughs> and just by being present. Dr. Vandermeer, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I um, so I interview medical uh, medical students. Uh, you heard that I was on the admissions committee, and um, or they're actually undergrads who are applying for medical school. And probably one of the most common questions I get is, "Wow, you're in pediatric palliative care? Like, like, wow, like how do you how do you do that? Like that must be really hard." And it always makes me smile because. I'm not going to say that there aren't days that are really hard. You know, I only take care of children with special health care needs. Most of my children have severe under, or neuro, underlying neurologic impairment. Um, my patient population is actually the exact patient population that was first targeted in the Holocaust. Um, and so I think there is some part of me that uh, really connects with what happened because that's my patient population. Um, and yes, it can be really hard to to work with uh, children who uh, who struggle. Um, but just because they're different doesn't mean that their lives aren't beautiful. And every single day I get to walk into a room and see children who maybe can't talk to me verbally, but they talk to me, they sing and they dance with their eyes and some of them actually will like clap with music. Um, and if you can get a child who maybe can't say words, but if you can get that child to laugh and giggle, that is like literally the best sound in the whole wide world. And they're beautiful and their families are beautiful. And it is just such an honor to get to advocate for them so that when people ask, well, why would you do this? I tell them, I can't imagine doing anything else. How amazing is it that I get to stand in their presence and just, just take in who they are um, and know all that they're contributing to society and to really speak out and say they are contributing to society. Just because they may contribute in a different way, it doesn't mean that they're any less. In fact, I actually think they're more. Let me, sit, let me tell you all, um, you know, you've heard it before, uh, probably, the allegory. Um, it's a story is actually uh, derived from um, a novel, uh, a small novel called The Star, Power, the Star Thrower. Um, but the more common uh, allegory you hear is a girl was walking on the beach uh, upon which after a storm there were hundreds, thousands of stars, starfish. And um, a passerby observes her reaching down to a starfish and throwing it back into the ocean. And, and she's, he says, what are, what are you doing? And, and she says, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm helping. <laughs> he goes, you can't possibly be helping. There are thousands of starfish here. What are you doing? Um, what, you're, you're, what you're actually doing um, is futile. <laughs> you know, if you look around, there's too many. She said, well, I'm making a difference for this one. And the passerby stepped in to help her, and together they threw the starfish back into the ocean. Uh, the point being, of course, that uh, when you're overwhelmed by there's too much suffering, there, there's just too much that one person uh, can't do to fix, you can just take accountability for yourself, be proud of what you can contribute, look for little ways to make a difference. And over the course of a lifetime, as you've committed yourself to ideals and values that are deeply held, you can be really proud that you are making a difference and the kind of person, being the kind of person that, that you want to be. Dr. Vandermeer? Yeah. So I think this is the lesson that 
the Holocaust teaches me the most. Um, this is a quote by Eli Wiesel, um, who is a Holocaust survivor. Um, and he said, among the prisoner physicians, medicine remained a noble profession. More or less everywhere, doctors without instruments or medications tried desperately to relieve the suffering and misfortune of their fellow prisoners, sometimes at the price of their own health or their own lives. I knew several such doctors. When I think about the Nazi doctors, the medical executioners, I lose hope. To find it again, I think about the others, the victim doctors. Why did some know how to bring honor to humanity while others renounced humankind with hatred? It is a question of choice. And I think that we all face that question every day in our own lives. And to, I'm also happen to be a huge Disney fan. I know like the Holocaust and Disney and you're like, how? I know, um, but <laughs> like how is that, does this girl like both of these things? Um, but I'm a huge Disney fan. And one of my favorite movies is the live action Cinderella movie. And in that movie, um, Ella's mom teaches her uh, this saying, um, have courage and be kind. And I think it's, you know, really easy just to be like oh yes be kind but I love that statement and just how it like um really is so prominent in that film um where you know Cinderella does all of these things around her to just go out of her way in just very mundane normal moments to be kind and that takes courage and I think this is what the lives of the prisoner physicians teach us to have courage just to have courage in the moment and think about this moment doing the best thing that we can possibly do for the human being that's standing in front of us. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Uh, Jessica, I actually can't see the chat because I'm sharing. I don't know, Dr. Morrow, if you can see the chat, if there's anything. There's no chat. Okay. Um, but we have really enjoyed um, getting to uh, present um, and would love if to answer any questions if there are any questions. Yes, please. You would help us feel useful if you asked questions. Like you know that we are at the end of uh, your very long week uh, getting to learn about the Holocaust. I just want you to know how um, incredibly blessed I think you are. I was telling Jessica um, at the beginning of this that, you know, I definitely did not get to learn in depth about the Holocaust like this um, when I was in middle school and high school. You know, every, I went and read about it on my own, but I didn't have someone uh, actually getting to hear about it from experts. And I just think that's so awesome that y'all have gotten to participate in this. Um, so kudos for y'all to y'all for um, really taking the time to learn about this. Um, so we do have a question that came through uh, from somebody yes. who's watching uh, our live stream that wants to know, um, how do you impart these ethical questions on educating medical students today? Go for it, Dr. Morrow. He does an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question, right? Because you might imagine medical students are ambitious, right? They said, they've said, I want to be a doctor. And then they've jumped through so many hoops. <laughs> they've done so much. They were a part of every club and volunteered in high school and then, and then worked really hard in college and were able to sort of go on that long path. And here they are in medical school. And uh, it's, you know, the, some of the hardest uh, coursework that, that they've ever encountered. And how do you talk to them about ethics? And for me, um, my approach is um, to try to meet people where they are. I assume the best in people. I assume people who have committed themselves to a, a long and arduous path are highly motivated. So I try to draw out from them, hey, what, what got you here? Why do you want to be a doctor? It's usually very humanistic reasons because I want to help people. I want to make a difference. And I try to draw on that and, and build on it. And honestly, the hardest challenge is to just try to nurture that and keep it alive because people, when they work so hard and people aren't always giving them that attaboy, girl, um, 
you know, they can feel lonely, they can feel unrewarded or, and question whether they should still be doing it. So to me, it's less about me teaching them to be ethical than it is to just sort of keep that little flame alive through the slings and arrows of a really, really tough path. At the same time, I will say the stuff that we just talked about, you know, yeah, we got to teach that. We get, we te we talk about Tuskegee. We talk about uh, Joseph Mengele. We talk about the Nazi experimentation in medical school. Uh, you, you know, medical students got to learn this stuff in, in detail, and they've got to learn the ins and outs of informed consent consent because that stuff's legit. It's relevant. It, it's an everyday thing. I appreciate the question. All right, thank you very much. I want to again thank uh, Dr. Mara and Dr. Vandermeer for being with us uh, today. Um, it was great information, very beneficial for, for those of us that are watching. Um, we also just want to take a moment before we close out to thank our sponsors for contributing to our programming this week, uh, including the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. And we also want to thank uh, those of you that joined us throughout the week to view these presentations, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, those of you that are watching individually or showing this to your classrooms. To learn more information about Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week, uh, you can visit our website at hmmsa.org slash thrw. That's also where you'll be able to find um, the presentations for this week as well. And again, we thank Dr. Morrow, Dr. Vandermeer for being here to close this out for the week. Yes, Dr. Morrow. Can, uh, you know, you made me mindful. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to the museum. Thanks to all those supporters that you just identified and to those teachers out there who are supervising this process yeah. this week. <laughs> Boy, we know the last few years have been just as difficult for you as it has for the students and the rest of the community. So hats off to you um, for uh, keeping the dream alive. You're doing the Lord's work out there and uh, we're grateful for all of you. Always fun to work with Dr. Vandermeer. As y'all can tell, she's awesome to work <laughs> with. So cheers to her too. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Again, thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful week. <laughs>